This is Off Planet Radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. We are doing an audio podcast only this evening. And before we get started, I just want to thank everybody, um, all the patrons and all the nice uh, comments and feedback and stuff we've been getting. We've been having a lot of interaction lately. We really appreciate it. We have a lot of new patrons, and we just, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, want to say thank you. We, we this has been um, really much more, like we've gotten much more out of this, just you know, than we expected to, and we're really enjoying meeting all you guys in the patron group chats and all that kind of stuff. So, thank you, thank you. And Randy is still on vacation, but I have an awesome co-host for tonight, and really looking forward to this one. Um, she was on our show earlier this year, and she and I have struck up a weird and wonderful friendship since then, and. Uh, was I was very sure that I wanted to have her as a co-host when I knew Randy was taking a month off. So everybody, welcome back. Nish from Noxmente. Nish, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Yay. Thank you, Emily. This is a great pleasure. I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this since you mentioned it. Awesome. So we just decided, like we tossed around talking about some things, but we decided like our conversations are so fascinating and interesting and <laughs> really weird that like maybe we'll just do that and let everyone listen and see what comes up for people. And we'd love to sort of hear back from you on some of the stuff we talk about. So um, we're just going to kind of get to that. And uh, just before we start, how's everything going over at Knox Mente, Nish? Really well. Um, Jerry's just booking amazing people. Uh, Jerry does like all the, uh, it's kind of like a princess setup because I, I kind of just show up and <laughs> he does, he set up everything. And um, so we have some awesome guests coming up. We have had some recently that were just mind blowing, some new information, new dots connected. Emily, you and wow. I have talked about some of these and um, things that I have not thrown out publicly that I'm waiting f- to have information come back to me, part of why Nox Mente started. And um, something did come back to me recently and uh, with Joe Root, actually. And it was, it's exciting and validating. Oh, cool. So Knox Mente is rocking. I'll have to go check out that show and see if I can figure right. out what we're talking about here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, I've hoped as soon as I, you know, I, I, at this point I'm super busy and I don't have as much time to pay attention to all the things I used to pay attention to, but I do hop in here and there. Um, but you know, I've been, I think we talked about this when you were on the show last time, like, you know, the most interesting part about this is going to be sort of, you know, the cross-referencing and the fi- looking at the similarities of people's dreams and what is going on here and who's who and mm-hmm. you know, that kind of, I mean, as a long-term sort of thing to look at. So it's interesting that you're starting to get some things looping back to you. And, you know, um, that's one of the things we love doing with the show is just putting out little bits of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, not like we're trying to keep information from people, but it's like, in order to figure out if something is just the creation of your mind or if it's a reality, you have to sort of throw it out in a way that like, you know, only people who knew what you were really talking about would respond to. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, even look at how Cliff High does it with, you know, he doesn't like to dirty the water with his web bot by right. talking about stuff. So there's, there's a purity in it. It's, there's no, like, there's not like hiding, you're not hiding something. There's a, yeah. this is pure energy and pure information. And you want that to come back to you. Yeah. I even have like some people who aren't even like, guests or anything like that. Some people who are just uh, people in the audience or um, people from our Patreon group chat that I have interested in having certain conversations with, but I haven't even approached them about it yet. Mm-hmm. drop little hints and I had someone come back to me. So there's a conversation I've been wanting to have with someone, but I haven't exactly said that. Like I said, let's chat, but I didn't say what about, and then it didn't, you know, I've been busy and it didn't work out. And then the mm-hmm. other day she sent me a message wanting to talk about the thing that I would have wanted to talk about with her, but she would have had no way of knowing that. Oh, and I love that. Yes. And um, yeah, like, so we do that too, just to kind of see, you know, what people are feeling out there and what's sort of, and I don't like the word trigger, but what's triggering what in people. I'm not trying to trigger anybody, but you know, we're, we're trying to figure out like, 
who's one of us? You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. That's the thing with the word trigger too. I mean, I, I used it a couple times in our pre talk and it's like I always try to find the right word trigger everyone understands that right now although I think it has a negative connotation but activate is another word for it but that that can be too strong sometimes so it's I don't know our language it's so difficult both trigger and activate are things that you know happen to people in mind control kind of situation yes Yes. you know I I, I just I've tried to play with stimulate a little bit or like you know like just it's hard you want to be really careful with language because yeah. i mean i get suspicious when i hear people using a certain kind of language as me and i got to the point where i can kind of parse out just based on their energy and sort of what's going on when it happens like whether that's their intention or not but yeah, yeah. it is it is we need trigger warnings for the trigger warning <laughs> i know right i mean i've even used ping it pinged me ping. and i mean ping, there's so, yeah you know is so good. it's it's difficult the, just the language alone navigating is a challenge at times absolutely and, and just to to be clear you're deserving of the princess setup i like the idea that jerry does all the work and you just show up <laughs> I, and you and I, I i sort of enjoy that about the situation <laughs> Oh, thank you. I um, I always am worried. Like, I have this fear in the back of my head that he's just gonna get sick of being Mister Do Everything. No, I, 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 he's, I, we've, he and I have never talked about it. But I can just tell energetically that he adores you and he loves doing this with you. And his, you know, like, there's no, no, he's totally into it. Yeah, so. we we do have a really great relationship. I I feel quite grateful. Yeah, in that absolutely. respect. Yeah, no, Jerry, like, you guys obviously do a show together, but I yeah. see Jerry as a person who's here to, like, be a cohesive bond for the community in a lot of ways. Yes. Sort of keep an eye on everything, and I don't agree with him about everything, but, like, if something bad and yucky and funny is going on, he's going to know it. He's going to be like, all right, what's going on here? Yep, yep. And so, he's always, there's always some jokes there. You know, he's always got some wit, I when, and I, I love that. Yeah, he's very funny. He doesn't mm-hmm. take himself too seriously. No. And which is good because no one else does either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> and he's super that. open. I think for people that needed for my needs for people around me is that that's a quality. Like a mm-hmm. lot of things I don't, you know, whatever, but you have to be an open person or to be close to me. Yeah. I completely I, I, obviously, you and I had a very open conversation before we started. <laughs> yes, we did. It seemed to make it better. <laughs> so, you know, there there we go. It's just, yeah, Nish and I have been chatting for quite a while before we got started here tonight. So, <laughs> It's so easy to do, Emily. Yeah, we get into it for a long time sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's funny. After you guys were on the show, we did get some comments. Like, you know, somebody was like, oh, we want you to please do an eight hour show with these people, make a show that never ends with these people. <laughs> and then some other people, there was someone else who was like, um, well, I guess this ends my private theory that Jerry and Nish are, and, and Emily and Randy are the same people. Like they thought, oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> fascinating. But I was like, oh, okay, that's funny. Well, we play with that. That's, you know what I mean? I was like, so that was funny. And um, yeah, so people loved when you guys were on. So we'll, we'll do that again sometime too. Yeah, and we have we have Randy on here soon. Yeah, uh, Nox Mente. Yeah, that that'll be interesting. Ran- yeah, I, I, this Randy's. Um, you know, we we talk about dreams sometimes, like not a ton, but like we do talk about like sort of other level experiences a lot, and like the area between sleep and sleep and you know wakefulness, and mm-hmm. um, this it will be interesting. We talk, you know, he's he's. Um, he has a very interesting way of like describing some of these spaces and whatnot. I look forward to hearing that. I think it'll be really awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm really looking forward to it Rand- as well. Randy's been on break. And so he'll probably have a lot to say. Sometimes he doesn't have a ton to say. You know, he's, uh, he's obviously doesn't not a, ma- a man of as many words as I am. Um, and, but some, sometimes he just has a ton of really just absolute, I mean, everything he says is fascinating, but when he hasn't, done it for a while then he you know you think you guys will get a really good show so that'll be awesome yeah it's gonna i can tell it's gonna be good yeah so all right so like one of the things we've been talking about like when you were on the show last time and you and i our last conversation we got really like further into some of this um idea of this octopus kind of thing this octopus entity right Mm-hmm. And one thing that happens frequently is like once I sort of talk about something on the show or talk about it with a lot of people, then suddenly it's just like showing up everywhere. Mm-hmm. And like I have done seen nothing but octopi everywhere 
since our conversation. You know, there's something, there's something about that whole observation, right? That double slit experiment where the act of observation and, and part of observation is actually talking about something molds the experience too. I just wanted to throw that in there because I feel that that's part of it. And it's part of the bigger thing that I feel is going on here. Yeah. I mean, it is weird. Like, you, I mean, it's sometimes whatever this is, whatever we're in, whether it's a simulation or how, what the fuck it is, I don't know. Like Some sort of dreaming. I will, or some sort of dreaming or some combination or sometimes one and sometimes the other. Like, mm -hmm. you can talk about, like, I, th whatever happens, I talk, lately, I talk about it and then it comes to me. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. Sometimes not in exactly the way I was thinking of it, but in an undeniable way. Yes. I had something just today, you know what I mean? Like somebody told me a really funny story yesterday, right? Like, and like an, like almost an exact replay of that story came to me at work today with something else, right? And I was like, this is nuts. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it was bizarre. And you know, I had, a, you know, something, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I've talked about it on the show and I told you about it with the chick with the clothes that was, like, you know, from Orange is the New Black. You know, yes, like, um, yes. Whatever, it's coming fast and furious right now but the octopus has been like so from the moment we talked about it um you know i i told you and um when we were just talking privately after that like i you know we, we talked about it in terms of the guy that you had on the show who ate the octopus and whatever yes, had ren collier yeah and, and it made what was his name again ren collier, ren collier and he's collier. fascinating yeah. And so then I talked about the story of the thing with the back of my neck and how I was feeling like it was something like that. And I, after we talked about it, I had really intense attacks of that all for like almost a week afterward. Um, almost like it, whatever it was new that it was being talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. and it was new versions of like when I would used to get it, when I would get it normally, it would be um, a couple times a week, really intense, strong for a couple minutes. So I had some of those, and then I had this one thing where it happened three times in one day, but like little mini versions of it, right? And then all of a sudden, I met somebody who did a healing on me, like, you know, about a week and a half later, and like it was the distance healing, and I kind of didn't really think anything would happen, but it hasn't happened since. Like, I've been like a couple, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, I've been a couple of, uh, of months out from it. It was like in April. It's been like two months, and I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. Like, both that, like, it came on intensely afterwards, and that I've been, you know, experiencing this healing from it. But as soon as that happened, as soon as, also as soon as we talked about it, I started seeing them everywhere. I had noticed mm. it before, like we talked about that when you were on. But yeah. The, like literally, I would see every restaurant I went into had something. Every store I went into had something. Um, like to the point, and it's not just like your standard looking octopus. These are like really crazy looking ones. Like I showed you a postcard last time we talked. Yes. And yes. they're like super like, I mean, it's like somewhere between like an octopus and like a bat or like some kind of manta ray or, you know what I mean? Like some kind of really, um, I don't want to say nasty, but some kind of really like otherworldly. I mean, octopi are otherworldly looking anyway, but we have the image that we think of them from when we were little. And this is not quite that. This is like much more, has a lot more layer to it, you know? Yeah. The, the ones that I experienced, um, didn't have quite like they were different. I was my dog. Sorry, yeah. um, didn't have. You know, they're not exact. Octopi is as close as I could get to describing what they are because they had tentacles, but they weren't. They didn't have that like bulbous head, but no. it was still you know like something there. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're not quite. So the whole the octopi gets your mind into that right area of visualizing it, uh, but they're not quite as we know octopi to no. be here. Yeah, these like these things seemed like much more, like whatever vision I had of octopus when I was younger for most of my life, this is something that seems like it could spread out much wider. Like, yeah. you know, like it has more like of a, like a blanketing kind of body and energy. Mm -hmm. You know? There's, um, they, they seem, they seem, I, I'm trying to do, oh man, they're just so hard. Actually, okay, so I'm sorry to kind of switch a bit. No, I, I wanted to ask you if you've heard other people talking about them before I get 
more into the way I experience them and the way that that uh, uh, information is coming back to me about them. So, um, uh, you know, it's a little hard for, because I talk to people who listen to the show, right? So like, right. I get, oh, yeah, like we're experiencing the Octopi too. People have told me they're seeing a lot of things with tentacles and rings on them. Um, like a lot of people, I, we've talked about talking about how they're showing up on every fucking menu now. Like it used to just be you get like octopus at a fancy restaurant. Now they're like on menus everywhere. Um, and then, you know, people, and we can get into this somewhat, you know, I, I want to hear what you have to say and then we can kind of divert into this somewhere. But it's also become connected somehow to some of my work on vaping because, you know, uh, the people are, um, somebody has brought to my attention that people are making these videos of themselves vaping like with like tricks and and literally like i don't know i think i sent you some of these videos blowing they're pretty amazing actually like, blowing like entities a lot of which look like squid or octopus or jellyfish or something rings into existence so i want to get to what you say first then we can like get over to that a little bit later but there is like people are talking about it and i'm noticing it i mean like it, what the weirdest part for me is the place i've noticed it the most is in the town that my mom lives in. It's in, it's ever, I mean, it is a beachside community, but I've been going to the beachside community. I've been, she's lived there for 20 years. I've never noticed this stuff before. And a lot of the places are new. So it's not like it was always there, but it's almost like feels to me like there's a rule that there has to be an octopus in every establishment. Like I see one everywhere I go there. And sometimes it's like in a weird way that doesn't make sense. There's nothing else nautical themed about the place. Right but there's this fucking weird octopus thing there somewhere. So that's the way it's been sort of occurring for me. What's going on for you with this? Well, I, I am, oh man, I don't even know. I don't even know how to parse it out. So just to recap on the experience I had is I saw them entering people and and so i you know there are other so if we're if you picture yourself in a dream mm -hmm. you picture yourself in a lucid dream and i'm talking base level lucid where you're just aware that you know you're aware of your environment yeah. and um it doesn't need to be anything more than that they they have access there somehow through mm -hmm. the etheric net and um and and the, the the takeaway here is that they enter through through our orifices. Now, if this was okay, so we're talking about symbols, right? Open holes as a symbol, mm -hmm. and um, so like for example, I was seeing them going through ears, mostly mm -hmm. mostly ears, but sometimes nose and mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I saw a very graphic one in a mouth and it was, it, it was so graphic. I actually thought that it was eating the person, but it wasn't because then it got in and took over the person. And you saw this in, in lucid, in a lucid dream. I saw this in something way more than a lucid dream. Okay. I, this, it was like waking life. So, um, it's, this is a problem with dream dream language. Everyone seems to have an idea what dream language is. And there's, um, you know, there's, one person will tell you that all the experiences that are all it's all lucidity it's just layers of lucidity right and then someone else will say well there's astral projection and there's out of body and then there's lucidity and and uh, you know this is part of what why i say you know keep an open mind i will i will walk with all the different terminologies and language but for me it, it does make sense more that it's all states of lucidity just like here yep um and so, but this was active, awake, feel, sense, smell, cut, bleed, that kind of thing. And they were etheric. They were, so they were tangible in a way that I could see them, but they were also like, like vapor, like smoke, ah, yeah. like formless smoke in a weird way. They would form, but then they could dissipate. Yeah, And that tied into, for me, when you brought the idea of vape smoke, I hadn't even made the connection. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, a, that's like a new pondering for me. You sent me those videos. I'm thinking, wow, you know, I think that Emily's made a dot connector here, for me at least. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the intent is, but it doesn't seem to be good. And the 
the thing that was over the, the overarching theme in this first experience I had was that it's already happening. It's been happening a long time. Mm-hmm. The thing is that some of us are now seeing it because things are getting the absurd nature of what the reality that we're all collectively somehow participating in yes. is, um, is bringing that idea of lucidity. So how many, how many crazy freak storms do we need? How much craziness do we need in the outer world before we say, am I dreaming? Right? Yeah. And then when we start questioning the fact of is this a dream are we dreaming now and and i just want to step away from if this is a dream where are you really i'd love to get into that later but for the context of this um there's an idea of okay so there's a lot of call to lucidity like in in your dream dream time that you think of weird shit makes you go whoa i'm dreaming well how much weird shit do we need right now people (laughs) because it's it's crazy and it's continuing to be crazier i was just looking at you know the the hailstorm that brought that plane down and i'm looking at these big hails from that from today that are that they must have formed so fast. I don't know. They look like bullseye rings and um, just so much stuff. And I'm wondering where is this coming from? So why are we collectively a bunch of us, obviously people watching the shower shows, both of them and a lot of other people um, that are questioning things. What's the difference between us and them and the thems i'm talking about are the people that seem to be sleeping and i don't want to be separatist in that i'm talking about people that are not aware so possibly um possibly infected by this octopi being that i get a feeling that it's kind of hive mindish mm-hmm. um and and so for me right now, currently, this will probably change and I allow myself to change. There's some sort of, um, like I said, hive mind to it. And and I, so, okay, one of the symbols in the dreams that was happening is my ex-husband, Scott, was, was so unusual that he would ever like look me up and try and find me and all this. And I, but because I have a lot of attachment to him at first in my, my union had said, Oh, you know, unresolved issues. He represents this and this. And, but then as I actually became really hyper aware and awake, he was still there and not a figment of my unconscious. And he was also not him. One of those had gotten in and the takeaway from that, is not about him at all. It's that people we know, people we may trust, people we are trusting with placement of power in our lives mm-hmm. are somehow possessed. And I say possessed in a very open way because these things somehow gain access to us, to our energetic field, mm-hmm. and um, are controlling them. So I'm, I'm not negating that the person is out or how, you know, soul taken out or whatever. I don't know. I don't have answers for that. But there's somehow, it's like the mycelium mm-hmm. underground, how it's all connecting and talking. Mm-hmm. And there's some sort of connection to the way these things look to me that looked vaguely like fungus I have seen in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And um, I hadn't I hadn't said that publicly because I wanted some of that information to come back to me, and some of it has. Like I just wanted to make sure it wasn't only me thinking this and um, and experiencing this. So. I'm laying all this at your table right now. That's kind of where, right. so where I have, I'm at. I have like a lot of things to say and hopefully I should, I wish I never have a notepad by the here. <laughs> I wish I would have had a notepad <laughs> at all. So I'm just going to, so like, let's, I'm just going to tell you the th- a couple things and then so we make sure I hit them all. I want to say something about yeast, fungus and parasites. I'll say that later. I want to say something about some of my experiences with octopi and where I think this octopus kind of thing started, like when, when, when did this start to become a thing? I want to say those two things. I want to talk about um, something that showed up in a healing for me just recently. And then 
sort of separate and later we can get into the vaping. We can move from the octopus into that and why we're talking about that and whatever. So let's try and hit all those things. So first okay. let's start with where I think this may have like started or come from or when it got ramp ramped up. Like I started um, so, okay. And I count myself as a person who possibly has been at some point it, was these things trying to get me and at some points may have had me. You know what I mean? And that I, you know, so, um, you know, like I think we're all susceptible to this stuff and I think it, you know, I, I don't think it's a necessarily like a permanent uh, sentence, you know what I mean? Um, but I, when I first really got into popping, dancing, popping, um, like I, one of the things that I'd say maybe around 2003, four five ish, like I had this maybe even earlier, this desire for my dancing to look like I had multiple arms. Like I wanted to, um, I wanted my, it to be like I had eight arms, like an octopus. Like I do a very like geometric style of popping that is sort of like, it's called tuts, but I don't do it like according to the traditional way people do it. I infuse a lot of tuts and a lot of stuff that looks a little bit like voguing. And if you watch those, you, you, you've seen voguing, right? That's yeah, like, I actually know what kind of popping you're talking about. Okay, so, so <laughs> yeah, I think we're close to the same with Jen, at least. Okay, so okay, so you like that kind of stuff too? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and so, I remember it well. Too. Yes, very good. Okay, that's the whole thing. So when I do it, it does. It feels very ancient to me. It feels like something I've been doing through all my lifetimes. You know what I mean? Um, and it's so I I sort of fuse like some sort of like popping and liquid kind of stuff with some tutting and then stuff that if I had more flexible shoulders, I would be wanting, I'd Vogue. I like, I love when that Madonna stuff came out with Vogue, I was like, I'm so taken with that. I couldn't even believe like just the, like the, I liked the sort of um, swagger that those dancers had and yeah. just the way that like, it looked like they just had thousands of arms. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And arms were long. You could do all this stuff and I'm just not flexible in the shoulders from issues with my neck and from being super strong and tight from gymnastics and then not, stretching for a number of years but if i could had flexible short shoulders i'd be like i'd be fucking voguing like i love that shit right i love that i love watching voguing competitions i love you know what i mean like it's just fabulous to watch to me but i love that idea of i wanted to look like i wanted to have multiple arms so that's a shiva thing but that's also an octopi thing and at the time i remember there was also there was this one popper that i used to like to watch called cephalopod and I was like, oh, yeah, that's, I love that. You know what I mean? And that's sort of more. <laughs> that, that says it all, too. Cephalopod. Yeah. So I was like, okay, so there's a thing. There's a thing. I'm not, the, you know, like, that's a thing here. So, like, this is probably part of the influence that's trying to be pushed into the dance music community and the popping community or whatever, right? Like, you know, I'm wanting that. And I did see some videos early on of myself dancing. And it did sometimes look like I had four. Like, more, I, could, I could make it look like I had more arms than I did. I never quite got the look that I wanted. You know what I mean? At a certain point, I sort of abandoned trying. But, like, when I'm in my, like, best, like, in my mode, in my groove and whatever, like, I still think about it. Like, you know what I mean? I still think about it like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that, like, you know, like, okay, there was, some, there was some influence that either was trying to be pushed in or that I was just drawing in or attracting. And how much of that has, you know, and I've spoken at nauseum about, you know, mind control and dance music and, you know, things that they're trying to do there. So there's probably some kind of connection there. You know what I mean? Um, so that's a thing. But I'd say about the same time, maybe a little bit later, was when I started paying attention to, um, I would watch some of these, like, uh, shows on Discovery Channel or National Geographic, you know, the deep sea shows and they would have, I saw information about these octopus that could, you know, like, I think we talked about this last time you were on, even a little bit, maybe these octopi that could uh, match any, like their, their skin could change in one second to match whatever, like. Yes, the camouflage. Uh, yeah, and they even, like, would put them in an aquarium and put, like, these incredible geometric patterns and crazy shit that wasn't anything to do with nature, and the octopus skin would do that. I was yeah. like, fascinating. So these things can – so with that in mind, I wasn't thinking this then, but I'm thinking it now. These are the perfect, like, predator or invader because they can make themselves look like you and just slide right in. And if you think about if you think about a mushroom, mm -hmm. the the head. The, so these don't have like the the white mushroom cap or anything. They have it's um, it's more like a thumb, I guess. Yeah. You know the head. But if you buried 
buried all the tentacles and you just look at the top as like a mushroom, it, like with a mushroom, there's all of that going on under the surface. Mean, and some of the, I, I know the kind of fungus you're talking about and we can get into some of that. Like when we get into talking about how this relates to some of the candida. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Fungus. But it's not, it's like incredibly, it's not, not just eight. It's like an incredible amount of tentacles and some are thick and some are thin and some are wispy. And is that what you're talking about? Like, are we talking about yes. Thing? But yeah. when I saw these, I didn't, I didn't count because there was kind of an urgency. Like they, they witnessed me observing them. And it changed the behavior, which is something I'm always mm -hmm. harking back to. And um, I could just tell they had tentacles. I couldn't, I didn't stop and count, yeah. but it was, it was enough that it made me think, you know, in the ballpark of eight, you know, several. Okay. Um, and so, okay. So that, ha so I had that. I mean, think about that though, the way that these things can camouflage themselves, right? Like they could like, you can see, like you can see energetically better than most people. I can, lot, there's lots, you know, people have varying levels of gifts about that. But the average person, like doesn't even know that that's a thing to look for things that look weird, right? So like it could literally be on someone's face about to enter their ear, about to enter their nose and nobody would know because it looks like their face. It's camoed, yeah. Yeah. So I thought about that when you were talking and then mm -hmm. I thought about, well, about the same time was when there was that story about like that, octopus that had died and was like they pulled it off the bottom of the ocean and it was like or came up to the shore and it was like the biggest one anyone had ever seen right i just saw that to me that shit looked like it was big enough to swallow the whole fucking world i i'm still in awe of it yeah like it, i mean it's all floppy and gross looking you know because it's dead and whatever but it's like what the fuck dude like that shit is in the ocean people are worried about aliens coming from space like that's like that's silly shit look at that thing dude Look well, and there's, and there's a long history in Mariner, you know, like sea, sea creatures and mm -hmm. um, with, with cephalopods, you know, giant, sh giant, giant squid, giant octopi. Um, so it's already out there in, in old school literature and in poems and in some songs. It's like it's just been waiting. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? But that death of that one then seems to have been when more of this stuff started coming in. I started noticing it in artwork. You know what I mean? Like I started noticing it like um, almost like maybe that was a sacrifice of one to bring in the energy kind of thing. You know what I or mean? Or like, to show us. Or to show us. Um, but it was, you know, like I remember watching that thing. God, that thing is just fucking massive. You know what I mean? And like it, it, it was just – uh, and then you had, like, during, like, the banking crisis, like, 2008, 2009, Matt Taibbi from Rolling, Rolling Stone, who wrote those great articles about, about the whole situation, talking about Goldman Sachs as, like, the vampire squid that was, like, sucking the life out of humanity. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, and so that, excuse me, uh, that just brought, like, a visual to, like, the social, like, what was going on socially that even though he said vampire squid, and have you seen a vampire squid? I, I haven't actually seen them. Uh, do I mean, they, are they for real? Yeah, well, like, I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't know if, the, if there's such thing as really a vampire squid, but there are these squid that like, I mean, maybe it's all squid, but we think of squid as not being that big, but there are some that are huge that like the way they catch shit and there's people who have even gone missing, like it, they have this one big tooth that comes like, like that's where you would think like the head of the octopus or the squid is. It's inside there and it shoots itself out and goes, it grabs shit and sucks it up back in. Oh, geez, gives me the chills. Right. Yeah, like I, like I was watching one of those, like, you know, shows about shit that happens in the deep sea, and there was, like, a fisherman that, like, fell off his boat and, like, got pulled by one of those things, and you know what I mean? Like, that kind of thing, and I'm just like, wow. And the ones they were showing were big, but not that big, but, like, I'm imagining if there was one that was, like, the size of this kind of octopus, like, it could pull a whole fucking boat inside. You know what I mean? Like, it was just... Um, kind of incredible and, and it's um, you know octo the octopus down there is scary and then I actually we can get into this maybe round back after we're done with the octopi and the vaping whatever I was talking to someone yesterday also about sharks right and you know when you put these things together octopi and sharks and and sort of what they do and what they're like and whatever like you know the sea is a much more scary and interesting place than this nonsense space they keep trying to distract us with
Definitely. There's, there's so much there. I mean, it's not even, yeah. I mean, we could talk about the sea for hours. It's, and, and especially like with the, the UFO stuff too, the stuff that the submer submergible stuff and all this information that's coming out is very fascinating to me because there's something in my mind. I'm not sure what it is in my logical mind that says this is more logical than than outer space for some reason and yet it it it's like above, as above so below really in the end but have you watched um any of those kinds of deep sea shows where they they're like uh down on the bottom and you see all those animals with that like, have like bioluminescence yes i'm fascinated by it where there's like no they look, light and they get they put off the bioluminescence they look like like so they look like space. They look like very spacey, right? They look like something you'd think you would see in space. Yes. And my only experience, and I've talked to other people who consider themselves to be abductees, mm -hmm. right, about this. My only experience, I don't have the feeling that I've been abducted by aliens. <laughs> um, I don't, I do know what the inside of a ship looks like though. And I don't know if I know because I was in there or because I remote viewed it. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. and whatever I saw was had a biological element to it. It like, obviously there was high technology there, but it felt biological in nature and the lighting on it, at least on the inside felt bioluminescent as opposed to our version of what we think electric or neon or whatever looks like. Right. Mm -hmm. And the inside was much bigger than the outside. Like on the outside, it looked like, you know, from the outside, it looked like, um, or at least my sense was that it was like the size of standard kind of, you know, thing you would think a UFO would be like maybe at biggest, like 30 by 30 or 50 by 50, right. At the biggest, but inside it was almost endless. Like this, you know, like it was like a shopping mall or a football field or something. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, and um, it felt as though the walls of it were like breathing or like inhaling and exhaling or moving. There was movement. It wasn't, I mean, it looked sort of metallic, but it had suppleness to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the colors were like, they're not, you know, the difference between the colors you see in the psychedelic space and the colors you see out here trying to imitate what you see in the psychedelic space, right? Right. Yes. Like there's a different, like, you know, you can look at neon light, neon signs or fluorescent colors or very vivid and bright colors. And th with technology, they're getting better and better and closer and closer, but there's not the level of information or emotion attached to the colors that there is in the psychedelic space. There's it. They are different, but they are getting close. I mean, they're it's close. Yeah. It, it makes me think of as I had said earlier with the the giant stuff they're pulling out, and in particular the octopus. It's what it's doing is it's telling us once we see something, then we can we can go. We know it exists, right? right. Everyone's like, I got to see it. I got to see it. Well, so a giant octopus comes out of the ocean. And, and then there was, you know, that movie, whatever, where they were kind of octopi creatures too, but they were gigantic also. Uh, are you talking about Arrival? Yes, Arrival. I was, that was, an, I wanted to bring that up because when you were talking about the thing that you saw, it made mm -hmm. me think of that. We were, I think, were you, you and I were talking about this last week when we had our chat. Yeah, yes. Yeah, just go ahead and say what you want to say and then I'll tell you what I was thinking. So, well, so I just want to, I want to say like, so this is coming, and, and of course, this, as I said earlier about the stories of the giant octopi taking in the ship and, and paintings and in horror and Lovecraft. And, and um, so it's out there and then we pull something real from the ocean, allegedly real, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so our mind, the suspension of disbelief now is engaged. This could be real. This could be real. And um, so now it's tied into all the stuff that we've been front loaded with, with the, the tales and, and then Hollywood stuff. And suddenly we have, we start to have a collective experience of this. Although I will say the ones that I experienced were, were small. They were like, mm -hmm. the, you know, they were small and they were, they would get into people or on them, you know? Um, so the, the symbols I'm seeing in the outer world are exaggerated as generally um, is observed in these kinds of sleight of hand uh, maneuvers that mm -hmm. happen with just storytelling. Like for example, a play or, 
or Hollywood or even telling, writing a good story, um, you exaggerate things to, for that effect. Mm -hmm. So I just want, I just am, all I'm doing is under, um, creating a foundation here for where I think you're going now. Yeah. So um, with the, with the vape and that in the arrival stuff. Yeah. So when we were, you know, um, we were talking about this in our chat last week and um, it's been coming up quite a bit. Like I get a lot of people, a lot of discussion around the movie arrival because the necklace that I always wear looks like the ship. <laughs> right? Yes, like, it does. Ship. Yes. Yeah. And so I had not heard of the movie. Like the first time I had any interaction around this was um, I had not heard of the movie. Um, and my friend like, called me and said, oh, I just, you know, watched this new movie that came out. He got like some, you know, burnt version when it was still in the theater. <laughs> He's like, it, it, it was really good. It was about, you know, this fucking alien stuff, but their ship looked just like your, your necklace and whatever, right? He's like, go Google it and look. And I did, look, looked and I was like, oh, wow, it does. That's funny. And then people started saying things to me like, oh, your ship has come for you, right? And all that. So it was kind of funny. But I didn't see the movie until like, mm, like six months ago. Um, and same was, here. It, it's recently that I've seen it. Yeah, like enough people had told me, "Oh, you'd like it." They're communicating telepathically. It reminds me of some things you talk about. This and that and the other thing. And so I had no idea what to expect. I went and watched it, and it was not at all what I expected. Right? Like I didn't. It was very um, ethereal in some ways. Like I didn't. I expected there was going to be like, you know aliens in the ship and the people are communicating telepathically and they're, I, I thought it was gonna be like a typical alien movie, right? Like, and it was just happened to be that the ship looked like mine. The mine yeah. Movie, as, right? as did I, this was something completely weird and different. And this was about like a communication that happened in a very, um, vape smoke vaporized environment, right? That like people had to be, a, have protection before approaching. And that was about these creatures that looked somewhere between an octopus and a spider. Um, and that they would sort of move forward and present themselves, create these sort of sigils that contained a lot of information. And even when I was looking at it, I was feeling emotionally activated by the sigils, even though I had no idea what they meant. You know what I mean? And it was like some kind of dye or squid ink or something kind of thing, but it was in this very vapory kind of environment. And it was, you know, affecting the, you know, physical field and the emotional people were having emotional responses and respecting their physiology. Some people could go close for long periods of times. Others couldn't. And it was, you know, you know, ultimately there wasn't to me like a lot of resolution as to what they wanted. It was clear they were trying to impart information and understanding about something and whatever, but it had this whole, um, this, you know, it had the world or whatever, this community completely captivated for a short time. And then it was kind of just over. And I felt like, so that was weird. But there was this like really deep, eerie, ethereal, like very just weird sort of tone to it that I was like, oh, that's really weird and interesting. And some of those, um, I mean, I think like, you know, it's, this is what sort of what you're talking about, sort of what we are talking about here. And like, what are these, I mean, they make these rings that have information in them, right? And, and that imparts information. And like, you're talking about the holes on the body as being symbols. Like, are they make, creating sort of sigils that they can then come through? You know, I've talked about this with um, sort of some of the, experiences I've had with sacred geometry when I'm dancing and that like if an entity can sort of if you're projecting geometry and the entity can line itself up with that if you don't have if, you know if you're not sort of blocking or guarding your geometry it can come through is that what this is um what do you think I think that um I want to say something I think it's interesting that it's almost dark here and I've got all this motion going on outside as yeah. we're talking yeah. um it's un it's uncanny i do this show with jerry every you know i'm always on this uncanny that this kind of commotion is happening yeah what i do think though is uh, regarding this is i'm wondering how much the dreaming within the dreaming so that we're having this experience and in the dream i'm seeing i'm i'm in count where i feel like the function of this is 
completely directly related to this, but it might sound like it's not the first. That So we dream, we go to bed and we dream, and um, that that somehow in that state, we allow ourselves to be open to anything that can happen, the whole dream landscape, the rules of the dream. And in that, those of us that are actually capturing and waking up in the dream, becoming lucid, whatever, pulling back information, bringing back information, are able to see bits of reality that are waking alleged waking mind discards and can't see so that whole you know the spoon is on the chair and so the idea of encounter and I'm, I'm hearing about other people encountering similar things like Rin did when he took it off of himself or he felt it physically in his bed um, but he was in kind of like a hypnagogic state mm -hmm. and so and then the symbols the geometry that lines up within what is this kind of etheric dream state um, is giving me personally the vision and now I come into my waking life and I've started to sense this feeling I get when I've seen them in dreams um, around people so for whatever reason, I've tied a connection between here and there um, and in, in, in the way we understand things anyway, now at least uh, without like being woo woo, you know, I'm awake and then I'm dreaming that's the etheric realm. There's a now a, a portal between the two in my mind at least where I'm having a conversation. Now I encounter these people in the world that formerly I was kind of calling NPCs right but I'm all but I'm open I'm open to anything and I'm, I will use language and I'll see where it takes me and I, you know and now I'm starting to see this kind of this connected to these things this thing this fungus this octopi this vapor mm -hmm. um, and I had woke up and I saved this for the show, I, uh, and I haven't told you. I woke up the other day from a very intense, intense experience, and the words on my mouth was, and I know this might sound cliche, but they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's what came out. I was, I was in a cold sweat, and again, it was that whole coming out, the, it was like coming out of um, a 3D chamber, you know, like it was in my auditory, my ears. I had to take a minute to come back into my body. It was so visceral and intense. I'm in a cold sweat, and my conscious mind says this to me out loud. They are everywhere, and because I've been sensing people that since I since I started playing around with the NPC dialogue and um and and also trying to be sensible about it. Like um so saying it's not the NPCs aren't flesh and blood and they're not having emotions and stuff. It's just that their program's so limited. And you start talking depth with them and they're just not there. And so I was I'm not saying they're not real. And and so now I am forming this idea that it's this kind of fungal takeover mm -hmm. and um, these things are conscious and they're definitely using sigiled language, sigiled symbolic language that is everywhere in our waking world mm -hmm. and toning into, tuning into, vibing within the symbols that individuals use. Mm -hmm. on themselves like an octopi does with its whole masking ability so you want to wear nike you want to wear nike shoes oh, yeah, you're inviting sure. that in right well also what about the f tattoos that people have on their body yes well i and mean it, how it, 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 can it, that be i mean really right? chew on that right well i mean I, I i started to i mean i have some tattoos and um i didn't get any for a long time and i went through a phase where i was considering getting some tattoos and of course like being into the geometry was thinking about that and whatever but I never did it like something in me was like don't do it you know what I mean and then I kind of then I had the experience where I you know realized that like 
how they lay down a lot of these mind control programs is through using sacred geometry sigils on your chakra points. And that's actually where the programs are stored, right? Like there's compartmentalization in your mind. Some of these programs or sort of the blueprints from the pro for the programs are stored in the chakra points. And they are these geometric, you know, very complex geometric patterns. And so I was like, okay, like, yeah, no more tattoos. And then I came to a spot where I recognized the tattoos that I ha already have are like brandings, right? Are like um, yes. entrance points or, or they're very important to um, the specific programs. Um, and so you also said something interesting, which I've never heard anyone else say, and I think it's great, like a great way to describe it. You said toning in, right? Because so much of this yes. is about tone. <laughs> Um, tone in terms of sound quality, tone in terms of uh, color, tone in terms of vibration, tones in terms of emo the emotional feel of something. Like, like that's what, like, when I'm feeling like stuff is weird these days, the reason I'm feeling like it's weird is not because of anything drastic. It's because of a certain, e certain tone to it. It has a, a tone to it that, like, yes. you know, a person that didn't have good vision might not see or a person who... You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And um, what is that sort of like, what did you take just winding back real fast and then we can go somewhere else. Then of course, 50 million more things are coming up while we're talking. I know, I know that always does. Um, so uh, what, what did you think the point of that movie was? I was okay. So I hadn't been exposed to the movie and I talked about that dream with some friends and they said you, you know when the movie came later when the movie came out and all this they're like you need to check this out and um i don't like to do a lot of so with my friends in person my personal life you know and and you like i'll talk but like i wouldn't want in public i i don't like to muddy the waters mm -hmm. and so um i i just didn't I was blown away. I guess simply, just just simply blown away. I, I think the whole, the, uh, I mean, I didn't even know where, these things were kind of exactly like I was seeing, but they were large. And I mean, they're, they're way different, but it was the whole idea. So they were basically the same symbol. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what blew me away. And they were, the fact that they were in this misty environment mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, it was part of how I was experiencing how they were moving, mm -hmm. you know, and um, just just blown away. And and so, and again, I, I think I said it earlier, is I think that it was, whether or not it's intentional, whether or not anything is intentional, things synchronistically line up. And, um, and, and it seems like once we, the act of observing, once we are actively observing, and if you think about this in terms of are we dreaming or are we not dreaming, what are we doing? But the act of observing how it changes the nature of things, and this is this is this is in modern day science, you know, double split right. experiment, and um, and on the quantum level, and um, so I just can't help but think how. We're, we're we're I feel lost it I feel lost here for words I, I I'm um like how how that um that movie brought this into people's consciousness in a way that that now now they can begin to observe it yes but the thing that seemed sinister about the movie even though the movie wasn't sinister and really what was sinister and it was humans of course yeah. um is and which I don't disagree with on that. Um, but I'm looking now at thinking a lot of people are possessed by this kind of energy, you know, yes. Candida, all that, um, is that they made them like they were friendly. And clearly my experience is not, they are parasitic. Right. Yeah. So they're not friendly. They did not, they do not have our best interest at hand. We are a form, we are a, a means to an end. Mm -hmm. in, in my experiences with them in the etheric level via dreaming within the dream. Yeah. Okay, so the last thing I want to hit on, we'll continue this in the next hour. Before we go into the private hour, I do because we've brought it up so many times, want to hit on a little bit of this with the yeast and fungus and yes. candida and stuff like this. So I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, like, 
you know, the can, candida is something that's been, you know, this, it's been, it's a human condition and it, it's, you know, been around for a long time, but it's been coming up more and more and become, it's become obviously the, pro, the problem and the cause of, of a lot of uh, almost all sort of health problems. And um, has, you know, people are starting to pay a little bit more attention to it. But this whole thing was like, you know, that you're seeing these things that are sort of mushroom-like. My feeling with all of what's going on, the candida is some kind of operating system. Like the yeast and the fungus is like a communication, um, like a, a network, like a cables, right? Like, it, like a network cables and uh, carries, um, or like the operating system of the computer, right? And then you have yeast and fungus sort of overgrows, and then people start to develop parasites. And I feel like, so parasites are generally wormy looking creatures, but if you look at them, they look like they could have been a broken off piece of a tentacle or, uh, you know, a long arm or a leg from one of these sort of yes. kind of entities. <laughs> and they um, love sugar. Like yeast and fungus uh, thrive on sugar and parasites fucking love them. And if you starve them of sugar, they will, they will die. And they will do everything possible to take over your mind and convince you to eat sugar so that they can be alive. And of course, within my theory, the sugar that they're eating is programmable matter that is program programming them to do what they're going to do, right? So is it possible that parasites in the body are sort of like, um, I mean, I've talked about this in other ways, but it's the, it's the receptor or the, like the, like if there's um, like some kind of telepathic communication between if it's like a tentacle broken off or it's some sort of like baby amoeba version of an octopus or some sort of lesser version, you know what I mean? That is in the body. Like they're trying to get this stuff. I mean, when, when the entity comes in and possesses people, does it necessarily have to stay or can it just go in there and lay these little things and come out, right? And go off and, you know, do it to another person. Like we don't know how many of these there are. Right. And so is it, and can I interject here? Yeah, please. There, so it's like anything that gets out of balance. Yeah. So like I innately just feel that this is, these are not good because they treat us, par they feed off of us and control us. But it's at the same time, I do believe everything has its place. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'm going. I'm going to mute because there's chaos. I'll let you talk. Yeah. So I, I, I hear the ambulances in the background, which is interesting. I'll tell a story about that. In the second <laughs> yes. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. I can't, you know, everybody has candida in their body and when it's in the right level, it's just part of the natural flora of nature. You know, yeast is natural, all that kind of stuff. Parasites should not be in the body. You know, I mean, parasites are like the part of this that is questionable. Parasites are like the cockroaches in your house, right? Like you get spiders, you get bugs, you probably shouldn't kill them. It keeps nature, nature in balance. You know, when you have an invasive species that has an agenda of its own, which the parasites do, or, or even what yeast and fungus does when it starts to overgrow. And I think we talked about this last time you were on where, you know, listening to Paul Stamets talk about how fungus really behaves much more like an animal with its own consciousness than, than it does like a plant, right? So like the fungus having some level of consciousness and then these parasites coming in. I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not able to fully close the loop on this here, but you know, you get where I'm going with this? Like, you know, like we're dealing with sweet, sugar, yeast, fungus, and then in the movie and in your visions and in, you know, some of this, it's this sort of misty kind of environment, which is like vaping environment, which we're gonna talk about in, in the second hour. But like, it feels like, and we have fucking chemtrails and, you know, weird stuff like that. It feels like they're trying to make this a habitable or hospitable environment for whatever this is. That's and an important, that's, I actually have to jump in on this because the overall, on that very first one I had, the whole, the whole thing led back to they were taking over. And, um, and the whole thing was like kind of like terraforming. Yeah. And, and, um, for whatever. And so like the, the visuals in the sky were, you know, the Kim trailed sky, it was gray and it was an intentionally smoggy environment and mm -hmm. it was smoggy enough that they were able to, 
move around freely like they were doing. Mm -hmm. And when I observed them, the, the ones that I saw in that first dream in the, in this like store and the, the clerks were on the ground and I at first glance thought they were being eaten by them. And I realized, no, they were, they were, they were attaching themselves Mm -hmm. because when I, you know, later on they, the, the clerks were fine. Um, so there's that, there was this, and everything got down to the fact that they were terraforming enough that they could walk around kind of almost like an open, openly. Right. So I don't know if that's a, if this is like a call towards the fact that they can't handle light. I don't know if it, it the symbol is for the, the chemtrails and vaping the simple the symbols were there though these symbols were all there they need, and it's like they it need, wasn't they, friendly it's like they need the same kind of moist environment that fungus thrives in yeah like mold and fungus yeah i'm also wondering from your description of the clerks on the floor do these things have the ability to temporarily put somebody to sleep or knock them out so that they can enter them and then the person just kind of wakes up and feels like huh like what just happened yes they were unconscious somehow they were unconscious and okay so the energy i got from the one that i actually had the like the little communication with that was outside because the, there was that one in scott that was clearly communicating with me and knew everything about scott enough to say things you know, it was accessing his neuro pathways and his yes. brain. And, and so, but the one that I had the, so I saw the two and, but the one that I had, I, I don't want to say eye contact because I didn't notice eyes, but were it noticed me noticing it. And, uh, you know, we had, a, we noticed each other yeah. and um, it didn't come off itself as like maniacal. It's doing its thing. It wasn't like we have a master plan and we're here to take over earth or something like that. It wasn't crazy like that. It was literally like the environment was right, whether or not they did the environment, but it was doing its thing. It's like stumbling upon a wolf eating a bird or, you know, it's, it was doing its natural thing. And so it wasn't, I mean, I can't stress that enough. It didn't seem to actually have, ill intent but it was ill intent to me because i look like the you know even though it was a guy on the ground but i'm a humanoid and it the person it was going to inhabit was a humanoid that's that's to me a threat <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> that's like okay your species is feeding off of my species and that's a threat well that's i mean that's the whole thing with parasites in general the parasites point isn't to kill you because then it, it needs to use you as the host Right. But like, you know, so it's not necessarily doing a vicious, malicious thing, but it's doing its thing, whatever it needs to survive. Absolutely. It goes back to that whole, that old meme of the spider and the fly. What's chaos for the fly is normal for the spider. Yes. Yes. Wow. All right. So I have, we we will continue with this into some other parts and I think more and more things keep popping up that are related to this. So (laughs) I'm trying to keep this straight in my head. I know, uh, me too. Before we close out the public hour, um, tell people where they can find Nox Mente, how they can listen to your show, all that jazz. Um, if you just type in the easiest way, I, I wasn't even prepared for this. The easiest way is just go to YouTube and type in Nox Mente, N-O-X-M-E-N-T-E. And that'll take you to our channel um, where we have all the stuff, including interviews Jerry and I do. And um yeah, that's the easiest way. And I'm sure Emily will have that in the have show that. notes. We'll have that linked for sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, for those of you who are saying goodbye to you right now, thank you very much for joining us. And for the patrons, we will see you on the other side. We'll be there in just a minute. Hang on. This is Off Planet Radio.